Slahayam Kanawe Tilikum, Slahayam Natchiks, Naganim Greg Archuleta, Yakanim Greg Robinson, Naga Sawash Ilihi Tilikum, Yaka Chinook Nation Tilikum, Slush, Nitsaika Mislai Kaba Slush Tum Tum, Nitsaika Chaguya Kwok San. I just wanted to do a little opening or welcoming in our Chinook Wawa language. Um, and just saying that to uh, hello to everybody here, my friends, everybody here. Um, as mentioned, my name is Greg Archuleta, and this is Greg Robertson. I'm of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, and Greg is of the Chinook Nation from the mouth of the Columbia River. And that uh, we're just good to uh, have everybody here today. <clears throat> What I'm going to kind of start and open is uh, kind of give you a little bit more about my, my family and, and history of myself and how that connects to the art pieces that you see here. Um, I am a descendant of Oregon City John, who was a uh, Tai'i, our chief for the uh, head person for the uh, Willamette Tumwater. And our village site was on the West Lynn side uh, at the falls, right at the falls area in West Lynn area. And uh, Oregon City John was one of the treaty signers of the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855. It's also known as the Kalapuya Treaty of 1855. And that treaty in included uh, many of the Chinookan tribes that were here in the middle part of the river here from uh, a point called Oak Point um, on the lower end, which is just uh, around the Rainier area. Uh, to the Cascade Rapids area where Bonneville Dam now is, and then um, up the Willamette River to the Oregon City area. Those were all Chinookan people. Um, so under the treaty, um, the Willamette Tumwaters, the Hualala of the Cascades, um, the Maknomas, some of the Vancouver Wanakansis, um, and those from the St. Helens Rainier area were all um, under the Willamette Valley Treaty. And under that treaty, then we were moved um, to the, the Grand Ronde Reservation. And the reservation is, uh, is, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. The reservation is, if you're not familiar with it, it's halfway between Salem and Lincoln City. Um, if you're familiar with Spirit Mountain Casino, the tribe operates the casino today. But uh, the, the reservation there was originally 60,000 acres. Um, and Today we have just maybe 11,000 acres, um, which is a whole story in itself of how, how that came to be. But um, so uh, descended from Oregon City, John, and we had our areas, uh, village area there at West Lynn, and then we also had fishing sites uh, on the Columbia River at the Cascade Rapids area, which was destroyed by the uh, Bonneville Dam. But we had fishing sites there at the falls there, the rapids. Um, then I'm also descendant from John Wachino, who was the Clackamas headman or Tai'i, who was also a treaty signer for the Clackamas Chinook. Um, and uh, the, the Clackamas had villages there at Gladstone area, at the mouth of the Clackamas. Um, he was actually born uh, on Eagle Creek upriver, and we had villages and, um, throughout along the river there, um, close to the Estacada area also. So. Um, Greg, did you want to talk a little bit about your family? Well, my family's all down around the mouth of the Columbia River. Uh, Bay Center is kind of the, the hub today of, of Lower Chinook. That's where our tribal office is. And um, uh, my family actually would travel from uh, the Lower River over to Willowba Bay. Willowba Bay was more of a wintering place, sheltered from the storms that come into the Columbia River in November. So we would pack up and our families could go over to Willapa Bay. That's where my, um, all my relatives, my uh, Chaish uh, being the most well-known is one photographed by Curtis quite a bit. You might remember a photograph of a Chinook woman on the beach with clam basket. That's Chaish and that's my uh, direct relative and she's buried there in Bay Center along with most of my family. Um, that's where I'm from. And then um, talking about the Chinookan people, and they like to flatten the heads, and that was kind of a, a status kind of thing. And my, my great-grandma, great-great-grandma, uh, Marianne Michelle, was actually 
one of the last where they tried to do the head flattening, but what happened is the agents caught them before they could finish it. So just, she just had a partial uh, the flattening, of the, and then they had that, have them remove the, the boards that they were using and stuff. And Chayish was the last Chinook, lower Chinook woman to have her head flattened. So what we're going to do today is um, kind of connect this, this piece here, this mortar that we have, um, and, and talk about it um, a little bit and uh, kind of connect it not only to focus specifically on, on this, this piece here, but also how it connects to the other pieces that are here um, as part of this exhibit piece area right in here, the Chinookan art form are the, are the Columbia River region. Uh, the art is represented from the mouth of the Columbia River, Greg's country, all the way um, to the Dalles and further. There's similar pieces that can be found in John Day, Umatilla area um, also. So pretty much all along the, the Columbia River area. Um, the, uh, the Chinooks controlled a, a huge area. So from the mouth of the Columbia to about the Dalles and about five miles inland and then up the Willamette River to the Oregon City area, uh, up the Clackamas, Sandy River. Um, so at, at the mouth of the river, you had Greg's people, which is the, the five uh, bands that are part of the Chinook Nation. So you have the, the lower Chinook on the Washington side, the Clatsop on the Oregon side, the uh, Castlama, Wakiacum, what's the other ones? Willapa Bay um, from that area. And then you have um, the, the Middle River, um, which includes the village sites like Kafapult, uh, where the Ridgefield Wildlife Refuge is now. And there's a plank house now, actually, that Greg was, and the Chinook Nation was very involved in getting that constructed there. Um, but it's uh, near a, a huge village site that was there. Um, and then it, coming into the Moknoma um, area, St. Helens, Scapoos, Rainier, Chinooks, people live all along there, both sides of the river, uh, Moknomas, and then the Clackamas, um, Winnicansis on the Vancouver side there, um, then the Willamette Tumwaters, the Clackamas, the Huatlalas, um, Waskos, and, and Wishrums, and upriver further. And uh, the, uh, the Clackamas uh, groups are very closely tied to the Waskos. Um, they actually spoke a dialect of the Chinookan language, Kitched, that was uh, a, a related family of languages. So the, our people would say they kind of spoke fast, and our said we kind of spoke differently. So, <laughs> but they were pretty closely related languages and, and family groups. Well, um, to talk about this piece here, there's, um, what we can talk about is that there's some similarities as you look at the, this piece and the other pieces in the case here and the other pieces that are here and that are common and unique to the Columbia River region. Um, and it's different than, say, the Salish art form or uh, further up the northwest coast, Alaska, styles that have become uh, predominant and um, popular uh, to create these days. Um, and this piece has uh, some of the characteristics that are, that are common, and then it has um, some things that are missing. So when we talk about some common art styles or forms, forms to the art, um, it's, I think important to remember that there's no hard rules. You know, the rules can be broken, and, and it really depends on the individual carver and the purpose that they created the piece for, um, and a, a whole lot of things. And of course, we don't know today who the, the actual maker of the piece was, so we really don't know what was in his mind or, um, you know, what his intent was. Um, so we have to be really careful, I think, when we look at the art form and we try to interpret um, what's there because uh, it's really, really a very personal um, thing to that creator of that piece. Um, so I think that's really important to 
anything today, that's, I think, one of the important things to keep in mind is that uh, while there's some common characteristics and stuff that each piece is unique and is, is from that person that created it. Um, but some of the common elements that you can see in this is one is, um, I don't know if you had a chance to come and see it a little closer. It's a smaller kind of bore motor and uh, um, it has carvings of triangles in it, a series of triangles that are in those rows on the outside. And those um, triangles are actually what make the zigzag. So by creating and carving out those triangles, they've made the, the zigzag form. And if you look at the other pieces here, you can see the same, similar kind of things where they're doing actually the same thing. Um, so that's kind of common. common. Um, you have the, the eyebrow nose piece that's a common element too of the form, and it varies a lot. Um, a lot of them would have head pieces too. This one doesn't have head pieces on it, but uh, it's on a lot of the art. Um, and then you have the arms and the um, shoulder kind of styles that you see in this that are, uh, you'll see that a lot in art variations of it in the, in the art form. Um, and then, then you have the figures there and it's pretty, again, pretty hard to say what they are. Are they brother, sister? Are they a couple people? Are they um, um, human or part human? All those kinds of things. It's, you know, a lot of questions to answer that we really don't know the answer to, um, to that. But you have uh, this one here, uh, kind of a bowl, and then they had, um, these were made in various sizes, so you had smaller ones like this, which could be like for, for a whole range of, of things. It could be for pitting in oil, seal oil or whale oil or something like that. It could be for holding berries or something. Um, are holding pounded salmon, dried salmon. Um, but these were small like this, and then they were larger too. And, um, and then they had very huge ones, and those were, there's some old photos of uh, Curtis photos, have you seen them with a the great big huge mortar where they're actually, you can see them with the big uh, salmon pounding sticks where they're actually pounding the salmon, which was an important trade item for the, the tribes upriver further. Um, but one of the things kind of wanted to talk about is um, how these, this, this piece and the other pieces kind of connect to place. And that's why I wanted to give you kind of a little background on the, the country here, because th these are from this area, from the Columbia River area. Um, we have one piece over there, the big basalt piece over there is from Salvi's Island uh, area. And then these are from the mostly Wasco, uh, there's thinks there's some Chinookan in there, and upriver ever pieces. And when we talk about creating something like this, one of the important things is that uh, all these things are, are living, living things. They're not static or dead to us. They're living, they're living pieces. And um, from the material that they're from, the wood, um, um, for instance, and, and uh, so to us, there are relatives, there are people. And uh, when you look at that piece and there's the tree that it came from, and those are our relatives. And um, within the Chinookan society, things had, uh, there was, status was very important. So you had the poor to the wealthy people. And if you went into a plank house, um, where you entered were the, the poorer people and then you worked your way towards the wealthy part of the, of the, of the plank house where the, and it'd be a lot more um, decorated, have a lot more of the art and pieces like that. Um, if you go to the Ridgefield plank house, they've kind of, it's kind of set it up that way so you can get a kind of visual perspective of what it kind of looks like inside those, those plank houses. But uh, even, we talk about people with status, the trees had status, and um, in the old stories, in, in Chinookan we call it Ikani, in uh, the Chinookwa we call it today Ikanam, which are the old, old stories that kind of tell how the world came to be and um, how it was prepared for the, the Chinookan people to come. And uh, one of the, the 
characters that help fit the world and prepare it the way it is. is there's a series of ancient coyotes, and one of them was Stankia. And the Stankia, or this ancient coyote, he uh, kind of um, went along and kind of deemed the importance of, of different things, such as the first foods, the camas and the wapato, the salmon, the lamprey, the sturgeon, and uh, those kinds of things. And then um, there's other stories that tell how uh, this grizzly woman, she kind of um, wanted to see how beautiful she was, so she would ask the different trees um, how beautiful she was. And if they gave a positive response, she, she would say, okay, you're a good tree, cedar, for an instance, said, you know, she was. And, and um, so today, cedar is a very important tree. Uh, we call it shlushtik, or the good tree, because it has so many uses. And so you have um, things like the, uh, this, this bowl here could be made out of uh, um, maybe perhaps maple or, or oak. And you have the maple, the oaks, and some of the, the alders, which were um, used for making utensils a lot of the time. And so they were kind of deemed for that purpose, okay, maple, you're good for, you'll be good for, for making the plates and the spoons and the bowls and things like that. So that just kind of ties, ties to the old stories and, and that, that relatively, um, that connection to status. The other thing is, I just kind of wanted to talk about was that, uh, to me, all, all these pieces that are up here are kind of related. They're all connected, and they relate. Uh, they're not a single item of, of one piece of art. In fact, in, in our language, we, we really don't have a word for, for art, you know, because everything is ingrained into your, your way of living your daily life ways. And so, and that's what I, I see here as you look at these, these spoons that are, you know, very well carved and a lot of time and attention taken to them to, to create them. And, and there's, so there's that connection to your daily living. Um, and then that, to me, that ties them all together in the life ways of the people and how um, even everyday kinds of things, there's a connection to the trees, that connection to the earth, the connection to your foods that you're going to use and put into those bowls or to the spoons and however you use them. So you're not only talking about what we see today as art, but you're talking and seeing a way of living. And that relates to how they were, were used. Um, they could be used for ceremony. Um, they could be used for celebration, um, for preparing the foods and um, a lot of the foods were stored for winter time, so you had to take care. And those were precious things, because if you didn't have them, you weren't going to survive. So you took a lot of care and maybe prayers and things like that to, to, for their safekeeping and well-being. And, and a lot of times um, for those things, we always made sure that, that they continued to come. The salmon bones we put in the rivers to, so the salmon returned for the next year. Um, things like that. Um, the other thing is, uh, um, again, they could be used for a lot of different things. Um, a Thai could say, okay, I'd like some, some bowls made or some spoons or ladles, and they could have you know, something that's special to that person. And in a lot of the, 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 the tribes, not everybody made this, these things, spoons and bowls and things like that. Or the, the carvings, you had specifically people that were trained throughout their lifetime to do those things. And uh, in the Clackamas, um, people, uh, it was important that you had um, the support of different things that helped you, guide you in life. And like a carver, there's a, a beetle that was important for carving. And so that person may have that beetle power um, for his carving skill. So there's, there's those kinds of connections also. Um, and a lot of the things that were made were also made for trade. 
So you'll see these things that uh, there's a lot of items found on the Clackamas River everywhere that were actually trade items. People sometimes kind of assume, well, this came from here, and so they must have made it here. But if you kind of look at it, you can see that there's some common characteristics to the group. And trade was very um, important to this area along the Columbia River, from Willamette Falls to Celilo, uh down at the mouth of the river. Um, there was a lot of trade going on from up the coast into the, into the interior of the, of the country. So even we had um, buffalo hides coming here um, from the plains area. Um, we had the mountain sheep that was traded from, from up north further, with the, the blankets and things like that. And then these bowls and stuff that were made by the Chinookan people then would travel to different locations and then we'd have some of their, their bowls and things down in this area. So you have a lot of kind of things that are kind of tied together and, and, and when you look at these things, um, I guess just to see that there's a, there's a connection to so many things. It's not a solemn kind of item, but there are so many ways that, like these pieces that are here today, that kind of relate and tie together to each other. You want to say, uh, well, at the end we'll do some questions. You want to um, talk about Greg covered most of it. I would say that None of the objects in this case would be owned by anybody but a wealthy person. So uh, as he mentioned, status, status is really paramount. It's the single driving main force for this culture. And you have your wealthy status, and it goes all the way down to slave status. So these are all wealth items. So these are all reflecting of people who are in that upper echelon of Chinookan society. People in middle class may own some more utilitarian types of things, but a lower class person wouldn't be allowed to have, probably not even be allowed to handle one of these things. Um, he mentioned the fact that they all are, have a spirit, they're all living things. And that is true, and, um, but there's a, there's a transformation that also happens. And you start with a sheep horn, and that's, that's at a certain status level. But all these things strive to gain in status, just like Chinook and people strive to gain status. So when a sheep horn is turned into a bull, it's now stepped up in status, depending on how elaborately it's carved, it's how high it can go. So all of these things want to go up. This carving here is a piece of yellow cedar. It was one thing before I started, and now it's something else. It's moved up. Um, he also mentioned uh, we need we talk about these things and where they're found. It's a really it's it's kind of a hit and miss because the trade route is so enormous. I mean, it's going everywhere, and you also have because of the status thing, trade trade gets you up the ladder in status. So there's all always trade connections being made. People are married into strategically placed villages and towns, and they're married into the upper class of that village. So, for example, Cowlitz, or Cowlitz, as we would say. Um, we controlled five miles up the Cowlitz River from the Columbia because we controlled trade, so we wouldn't allow anybody to come within shooting distance of the, of the main trade areas. So wherever that point that village was on the Cowlitz River, there would have been a lot of Chinooks married into that. And the Cowlitz would have welcomed that because Anything from the lower river is wealth, and so it improves their standing as well. Um, so what happens is you see those people getting married off, they're taking things with them. They're going up to Kalitz, and if it's a man, for example, maybe he was a carver at home, now he's carving the same types of things in Kalitz country. And then those artifacts are found there, and everybody goes, oh, it's a Kalitz bowl or a basket. Um, so it's really confusing in people, and there's a ton of stuff out there that's misidentified. Um, it's very difficult because the piece is found at Salvi's Island. I think it's safe to assume that that rock over there that weighs probably 1, 1,500 pounds came from Salvi's Island. But many of these pieces could have come from anywhere along the river um, and beyond. 
it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be unheard of for any of these pieces to have been made in Alaska and have come back to the Columbia River because you have Chinook and people in Alaska, you have Chinook and people at the Dentalium Center of Vancouver Island where all the money shells are being pulled up off the bottom. Those were all been intermarried with Chinook and people as well. So, you know, there's a record of, there's been missing for a lot of misinformation. For example, uh, that we use bent wood, steam bent boxes because one was found down in the Columbia River. But we actually did dugout boxes. And, but that's not to say a Chinook didn't make a steam bent box because he learned it from an Alaskan native and thought it was cool and decided to make one, or it was made by an Alaskan native who's married into Chinook. So you have this huge stirred pot of goods everywhere. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt when it's stated where it, where it was found. It may have been found there, not necessarily where it originated. Um, the little bowl up there actually is being called a mortar, but uh, I would actually say it's a bowl. Miniature mortar. Yeah. And mortars are typically made out of burl because burl is the grain and burl is going every which direction so it's able to withstand the impact of a mortar. Whereas a bowl is meant to hold um, mainly oil for dipping. For, you know, for example, in the spring when the um, salmonberry shoots are up, that was very, one of the very first vegetative uh, fresh goods, greens that can be had and it was always dipped in oil as a way to help cut the astringency of that plant, as a way to help the stomach be able to handle it. Uh, and, and you see they're all black, and that's, that's usually an indication of oil being in them. So whale oil and seal oil were the two main oils. Um, this is kind of like the fine china. So when a guest would come, any time a guest would come into a house, any time of the day or night, whether you just fed the family 10 minutes ago, food was prepared, fresh food was prepared for that guest. And depending on the status of that guest, you know, these bowls would be brought out and he would be served. Even if it, maybe it's an oil bowl, he's going to be served stew in that because he's important that way and they want to impress him and make sure he, he knows he's been well taken care of. So status, and uh, I think it's worth mentioning taboos. Uh, very regimented way of life. There were thousands upon thousands of rules that were specific to areas and activities and all of these things governed what you could and couldn't do at any given time. And all of those types of things are influence what goes into these types of carvings. And I mean, just because you see something that looks like a human, it could actually represent a supernatural being from the world before this human world, which was the animal, supernatural animal, human being, time, and then they could transform back and forth at will. Um, a lot of these representations, uh, easily, turtle bowls is a, is a, or beaver bowls is a classic example. You know, highly unlikely that it's probably not a beaver, it's more likely to be a supernatural figure of some sort, mythological creature. Um, not too often do you see animals being created for the sake of the simple animal that it is today. Almost everything refers to the world before this one, when the supernatural world and land of the dead and everything is all connected. Um, and as Greg said, we look at, I mean, we have the luxury of art today, but really this is more about um, kind of physical expression of a really abstract way of life and with taking into account those taboos and, and the mythology and, and all of that. So, um, what else is to say? I guess I'll talk before we go into question and answer, explain. I brought, the reason I brought this panel, a couple of reasons, it's a modern Chinook carving, for one. There's not very many of this carving today. Greg and I teach cultural class and we teach carving specifically to try to get youngsters to learn it and to start producing it. So I'm not one of two that are producing it. Um, so in the plank houses, we didn't have totem poles. So the largest wood carvings would have been the house posts themselves inside the house, and then we had what we call uh, power boards or panels, we call them today. The power boards would be stood up both inside and outside the house. They were reflections of whatever the homeowner wanted to express. Um, if he wanted to express his tamanos, which is, would be his spirit power, he would make a carving, but he would never explain it. 
So if this was expressing my personal Kamanawas, I wouldn't tell you what it meant. Because by telling you what it meant, I give away some of my power. And because I'm interested in status, I'm not going to give away my power cheaply. So, um, but in this case, this panel shows a monster, which is here. Um, sure. So, these monsters were everywhere. And most of the stories have references to monsters. Um, if you think of the river back in those days, the forests were almost impenetrable. You could hardly walk in the forest. So river, the river and the banks were the main way to travel. The forests were old growth spruce and fir falling all over the top of each other and they're all tangled. And when you got an old growth that's you know, six feet in diameter, you can't just quickly jump over those and navigate your way around. So they were dark and scary and full of these monsters. And so in this case, it shows a forest monster, and it is shaking its rattle. This is a shell rattle right here. And it uses that to lure people into the woods so they can be eaten by him. Um, you can see here he's holding a human captive, but kind of the focal point of the story is not so much the monster, but his rattle. Uh, this is a human effigy handle. Uh, but the, and then here being the shell. But these little figures up here are the, are the supernatural beings that live inside the shell. And they're the ones that have the power to lure humans. And it's holding a head here because it's showing off, it's kind of boasting about its power to lure people. And um, so those are the people that live in that, in that shop, in that rattle that have the power to lure. These are just representations of power. Um, so, and these monsters existed in the forests, they existed in, um, a lot of them existed in the river. The deep, swirling, crazy currents that you have on the Columbia River, some of those would consume canoes regularly. And as good a canoe operators as we were, you know, some of those currents would still pull a canoe down. And those were always blamed on the monsters that lived in those particular holes down there. There were little people that lived down there. There were worlds underneath that film, that surface film. And, and in some of my pieces, I, I oftentimes show that, that world underneath the water. Um, and then I brought this, this isn't finished, but it's just an example of the style of bowl, a larger version of, of that. And it just shows a tie or a chief, what we call a head man. And this is his elaborate headdress. There's only one piece I see here that has these headdresses. The headdresses are rather common in the art form. Um, there's not many photographs of the old ones. I think one of my relatives at Bay Center um, is wearing one of the only ones I've ever seen from the lower Columbia River. And they're large kind of fur bonnets and feathers that are up and they have the Italian mat medallion with the front of the Italian passes coming down. Um, those Especially in some of the bone carvings, I think you'll see a lot of that. Really elaborate, oversized headdresses. Kind of like, and I almost always portray that in them. Because this headdress actually states the status of this monster, because they also have status that they're worried about. And that's just a reflection of his wealth and his standing amongst his own kind. So, with that, you got anything else to add? Well, kind of one, one of the things I wanted to do today is while well, we have these these pieces here that are that are fairly old that we wanted to kind of um, show you that the art art form was still alive and that our our people our tribes are still practicing it and right now we're kind of in a kind of a cultural renaissance again with with the tribes and um, for our area the Columbia River region it's often been um, overshadowed by the the Alaska art form, the Northwest Coast art form. And so um, a lot of times nowadays, and you'll see, and you go downtown, you'll see the, the totem poles, different places and things like that. And as Greg mentioned, we, we didn't have totem poles. You know, we had more like the, the power boards and things like that. So you know, what we're trying to do is to, um, keep, keep the art form alive, um, teach people about it and how it relates to place, to the, to 
to the Columbia River region, to the Willamette River area, river area to Portland, um, this part of Oregon, Washington. So that's kind of some of the things we do. And um, here's a rattle that I'm working on here, um, sun, sun rattle. And this has been a, actually uh, Greg's one of our teachers. Um, he's been carving a few more years on me, so he's been kind of my, my mentor and stuff like that. But we have, um, at the tribe now, we're doing a lot of, of, of carving things. We have a carving shed down there. Um, so they're working. We have actually an apprenticeship program right now where they're teaching young people the art form. And um, just visited, we were at the, our, at the canoe journey this past uh, couple of weeks here. And uh, Showwater, they're going to have a, a Chinook, Chinook and family also from uh, uh, on Willapa Bay, and they they have a apprenticeship three year apprenticeship program that they're doing. So a lot of the tribes are, are are focusing more efforts on trying to bring back these traditional arts, whether it be the Columbia River art form, the Salish art form, and the other art forms in their region. Yeah, I would mention. I want to reiterate that this is not Coast Salish art, but this is Chinookan art. And many experts will argue me that this is the same as, as a variation of Coast Salish art, but it really isn't. There are key identifiers which, um, because we're on film, I, don't want to, I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but um, there are key identifiers that can distinguish Columbia River, Colum you know, Chinookan art from Coast Salish art. It's quite, quite obvious once you looked at the overall pattern of these identifiers that are in this art form. So I always, want, I always try to mention that whenever I'm talking about the art, it is not Coast Salish art. And, and Greg mentioned the Northern Form Line. Northern Form Line, as you know, is extremely powerful form. It's beautiful when it's got bold elements and they all mean something. And as our local cultures were going through the hard times that we went through due to mainly early contact, for example, Lower Chinook, as many of you probably know, had contact in the late 1700s. So we were just as huge as we were, you know, after wave after wave of epidemics and disruption and alcohol and, and what have you, a lot, you know, a vast amount of this knowledge is lost. And then those that survive are trying to survive and it's not popular any longer to be an Indian, so you're trying to find work in the white world and you push all this aside because you don't want to be connected with that anymore. You're trying to feed the family. So in that vacuum, here comes the Northern Form Line because they've had a more intact cultural presence. They've managed to stay more or less intact, although they had tremendous disruption also. Um, so anyway, that art is more studied and so you have academics that come down into the lower United States and start teaching it in college. Bill Holmes, for example, um, is one of those academics that's really really lit that fire, and that fire spread in that vacuum because there's nothing else to represent that art. And unfortunately, still to this day, you know, with the cultural renaissance, as Greg said, among many tribes, there are still tribes producing form line. Quinault would be an example of a tribe still producing predominantly um, form line, even though their, their art form is much more similar to ours. Um, but there's baby steps in that direction. That's why we teach the classes we do um, to try to I mean, we do a lot of programs at the Plank House in Ridgefield, and we do probably a thousand school kids every year the same way, trying to break that kind of cycle of misinformation about Chinook and culture. One of the most unrepresented art forms left, I think. There's quite a few artifacts, but very little literature about it that's accurate. There's a lot of bad information in books. There's not a single book I could recommend to you that was accurate. Um, but you can look at the pictures. This museum put out a good book, picture book. I think there's some questionable text in it, but you can look at the pictures and you can see the similarities in the art form. You can see a lot of those identifiers yourself. I will say the threes and fives were a very quintic uh, group of people, five being the primary uh, important number for us. And Greg, I think it's threes, but threes and fives. And you'll see, I'll kind of give that up as one of the identifiers You'll see that oftentimes in these um, in these art forms, but it's a rule that's sometimes broken. So, 
Uh, one of the things I say is that uh, you see here they have a few pieces here in the art museum. And uh, for our tribe, one of the things that happened was there was a, a minister that came through when the reservation was established and he started um, um, getting pieces from different tribal members. And what happened is that collection of, of pieces then ended up um, over time in the British Art Museum. Um, so there's, uh, I think it's well over 100 pieces, um, a lot of them from the Grand Ronde Reservation. There's some other Chinookan pieces, the Klamath Reservation, Puget Sound area pieces that are over there. And they've had them pretty much in storage for over 100 years. Um, and maybe show a few of them. But it's just an incredible um, collection of of items that came uh, specifically from this, this region, uh, northwestern Washington and Oregon. Um, so our tribe is working to kind of, to maybe hopefully one day get that collection returned over to here, to this place. Um, so that's kind of one of the efforts our tribe is involved with. And as you know, we have the, um, the Grand Round Center on the next floor here. And um, I'll probably, age myself a little bit, but uh, it's the, part of that includes the Elizabeth Butler collection. And uh, when I was a student at the University of Oregon, she had her a museum there in Eugene. And uh, one of the things we had at the try our students there had an annual powwow there. And so we'd go around asking for donations and stuff for the powwow. And one of the places I'd always have to go to is go visit Elizabeth. And, and so I'd go there and uh, visit with her. And her, her big concern was that uh, what was going to happen to the collection you know, over time. And uh, um, it was just pretty neat to see them you know, as the tribe got the resources to, to um, help bring that collection here to the Portland Art Museum. So that's just kind of a little, another little connection in how things work. So yeah, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, we'll make some tools, um, and then there's just different car carving knives you can buy, and then there's uh, specialty carvers that uh, that make knives to themselves, and so we'll we'll get them from from them. So it it varies a lot. Do you want to add anything? Well, I would just you know in my personal collection I have a lot of commercial carving tools. I like the Swiss chisels, um, but I also have. Uh, Items that have been traded to me by other native artists, and I have some that I've made myself. And so it's just a variety of, of tools that are used. Mm -hmm. um, well, Chris, can I just say how happy I am that you're happy that the things are here in this museum? <laughs> we try to do our best. Um, I have questions about these large figures. Um, I, mean, I mean, you mentioned the, the headrest. Is, is that what we're seeing at, at the top of these mm -hmm. pieces? And I, Dina told us that the lower Chinook head piece like had a different head headdress than these other ones. Um, do you know what these might have been used for? Were they markers, representations of people or spirits? And, and then, of course, I've also heard from Dr. Kaiser about the ribs and the stories about the ribs and um, uh, vision quest. So I don't know if, there, if you want to talk about any of that. Well, the Tamanawas things are best not talked about on film. You know, if you want to ask me after the filming's done, okay. we can talk a little more about Tamanawas. But yeah, they are representations of, of headdresses. Stone being the difficult medium it is to work in. And I will say, Chinookan culture was the largest stone carvers north of Mexico. So that being an example of the largest one, of course I carved one larger recently, so I suppose I could lay claim to the largest one, but I won't. <laughs> Do you have any sense of how old these particular yeah. kinds of pieces are and why why they stopped making 
uh, stone objects like this it appears that you don't see these stone well objects. interruption stopped everything stopped canoe so you making. think it was the historical yeah. I mean, these, these could be 2,000 years old. They could be 500 years old. There's no way to know. I suppose you could, there may be some modern scientific way that, these are all ma made by, I don't know if you're familiar with the term pecking, but mm -hmm. it's a process where you take, they had a whole array, like I have carving tools, they had a whole array of hard, different hardness of stones and shapes. And, it, and it's all formed by removing one molecule of stone at a time. It's a very tedious process. So. Uh, whoever's invested in doing that, it's, it's extremely important to them. Mm -hmm. um, and it could mean anything. This most likely is a reference to a mythological, supernatural creature. That one over there could be anything from a, a very important headman or a taiyi to, again, a reference to, I mean, if that was coyote, for example, that could be coyote in human form, it could be blue jay in human form, it could be any number of things. Uh, and there's no way to know for certain. But it is nice to see that it still has red pigment on it. And the red pigment binds in, on a molecular level when the stone is fresh. So when they rub that red pigment in that freshly pecked rock, it, it actually hardens into there. So that's kind of cool. But if they stopped before the advent of, of whites, would they have been able to make the Well, it continued until about the late 1700s. These, these yes. kinds of figures? Yes, yeah, until post-contact. And, pr and probably still being made to some degree, you know, a couple of hundred years after contact. But when you lose 90% of your population, and those craftsmen will spend their entire lives doing just one thing like that. Mm -hmm. And that's lost. Now that person can't teach right. the coming generations, and you get start developing enormous gaps. So you think it's really the disruption? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Until then, they were still working. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing is with, with contact, too, you know, there's different types of tools and things that were brought in, too. And so different things, you know, the art form could, have, could change, went a different direction, too. Things like that, too. But the biggest thing is the disruption of, uh, brought on by the waves of diseases. And like Greg's saying, you lose 90% of your your population, and that's going to impact a, a lot of the life ways of the people. What sort of slavery did they practice? Was that also through trade up and down the yeah. rivers? And, and then would you get status for having slaves, and could slaves themselves seek a higher status, like the art? Slaves could, you know, the thing about status is you could go up or down. So you could be among the most wealthy and powerful of headmen and lose it all in a gambling session. But that person could never be relegated to slave status. They could be relegated to lower status, but not in slave status. A slave could work his way out of slavery into low status, but probably not much beyond that. Slaves were property. They were, and slavery wasn't unique to the Columbia River. It's practiced up and down the entire coast. Um, there were people that came into Chinook country and took slaves. And so when you, and one, in respect to that, the head flattening is, is uniquely from the Columbia River, but you see other tribes begin to practice that because it protected them from slavery. Oh. You, were, you weren't going to take a slave that had a flattened head because you wouldn't be able to unload it to anybody. Nobody would take that, that person. So uh, you see, you know, the Flathead Indians, for example, got labeled that because there was some mention of flattened heads. Of course, it could have been Chinookans that were up there in that country too, but. Um, so yeah, slaves were a wealth item. They were a status symbol. They were tr traded just like any other uh, material good would be traded. Uh, a unit of worth or a unit of a measure of wealth. And then like Greg's saying there, like in our tribes, like the Tualat and Kalapuya were uh, closely um, associated with the, the Clackamas being neighbors next to each other. And so they actually practice some of the, the head flattening too. Um, so you do have that kind of interaction between the tribes. And again, it's about that status where um, there would be intermarriage. And like if a, a Clack, uh, Tualatin married a Clackamas, um, you know, that helped them get 
access to family ties to like resources. Maybe they can fish at the falls or they can get fish from the Clackamas and things that help their tribe out. And so that kind of um, hired the status of that person. There's stories, the old stories that tell of some of these ties and how they became ties because of those, those intermarriages and those relations they had with, with those tribes that helped them gain in status. The, the tribes have a uh, um, big interest, and one of the things kind of wanted to say earlier too was that uh, that uh, while you know our tribes were relocated to the Grand Run Reservation, that we still uh, keep uh, ties and connection to the, the the homeland areas, such as here along the Columbia River and, and Willamette Rivers, and so today we still continue to be involved, we're very involved in like the super fun cleanups on the, on the Willamette River. We're very involved working with the cities of Oregon City and, and West Lynn on things that are happening in that area too. We have numerous things that we've, we've been involved in, including um, looking at what the opportunities are after the mill closed. So. One of the other things too is that our tribe is uh, um, working now um, we um, purchased the, uh, an elementary school there in Grand Round that closed, and we're actually working right now to, to um, create a tribal museum there. So they're actually, hopefully within the next year here, they'll start some construction on the first phase of that. Mm-hmm. Like when I started, I would do some templates and stuff, and then you use tools like compasses and stuff and plates and whatever, depending on the size. But the, the, uh, when you do the triangles, it just gets easier to uh, just do them freehand. And so these, a lot of these I just did, did freehand. I didn't use specifically. Yeah, yeah. You just, yeah, just over time you just get used to it. I'm pretty slow. He does it pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, the important thing about those is oftentimes, depending on light, you see the, the triangles cut out. But the important feature is the zigzag. The zigzag. That's, that, yeah. that's really what they're trying to portray is that the, the, the triangles are a way to get to that. Yeah. And the zigzag has meaning that can't be. It has, yeah. And, it, you know, I don't think there's, there's nobody alive that can say exactly what that means. but. It most most certainly is is likely to be tied to the supernatural realm of some sort. Yeah, you mentioned just a fascinating thing about the community lighthouse and hierarchy. Uh, and it was puzzling. I had I had known about this place about the last year. Yeah, stripped. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the, I think, important measures of wealth was how well you took care of your people. So, you know, however wealthy that, that person was of that house, what the important thing was and how you, you distributed your wealth is how well you took care of your people. So that, to me, was a key and It's hard key to look at that world back then through a lens of the modern world because it was a very difficult you know, we would call it brutal and barbaric and callous and unfeeling, but it was just life back then. That's what you grew up in. That's what you perpetuated. And um, so, it, you know, it, it's easy to sit here and talk about it, and, but it's very difficult to really put yourself in the place of, if you were to be able to transport back into one of those houses today and understand the word, you know, language and know what was going on, you would just think it was the, 
probably the most brutal and crazy world you were ever in, but it was, so you know, these are all representations of that world, not modern world, not how we interpret things today. So even as coming from that culture, I don't, you know, I could never say that I have a firm grasp on just how difficult that life was. Yeah, it's a strange yeah. mix. Yeah. <laughs> Very much like the modern corporate world in a lot of ways. You, you know, your Bill Gates today would be the, would be Com Comley of the Chinookan days, and there were a number of different Com Comleys. But Com Comley could walk into any town and command whatever he wanted because he was of that high status. Even if even if you know we call them, a lot of people call them villages, but they're really more like towns. So you know. You live in the state of Washington, you have all these towns. And there on the Columbia River, you have all these villages, which were just different towns. They weren't all controlled by any one head, like a governor or anything. But they were controlled by status being the number one rule that dictates everything. You know, Com Comley could come down and rouse up a thousand canoes and, uh, in you know, half a day. And so he just, those corporate heads of the day were extremely powerful. And you know, you're not going to stay powerful and well wealthy if you beat down every single person underneath of you. So it's in his best interest to make sure the culture's thriving around him. So it's a hard thing to put in perspective today. Any other questions? Okay. Well, how you must see kind of. Kind well, of I'd be unfortunate if I didn't uh, mention that this piece is going to be uh, part of a solo show that I'm doing at Quintana's in October. So if any of you happen to be in the neck of the woods uh, during that time, this is kind of be one of the centerpieces of that. So please come on down, say hello. Yeah. We're going to be doing some drumming and singing there. And will it Will it be painted? No, it actually it's will, will stay there. Yeah. Well, you're, I've seen your other work. Yeah. Matter of fact, I have to meet her after this and drop this panel off. So this is done now? Yes, it's done. Ready for the All right, well, thank you guys. Okay, thank you.